This is Our View, brought to you by the people who work for you, the proud members of the Washington Federation of State Employees. The Federation recently met in convention to set and refine their course. Many important messages from guest speakers. Here's an overview. You are the warriors in the battle over protecting the social safety net. You are the warriors in the battle over uh, fighting for social and economic justice. You're the ones who take care of the sick and elderly. You're the ones who take care of the mentally ill and the developmentally disabled. You're the ones that take care of our injured workers. You're the ones that take care of the unemployed. You're the ones who take care of our parks and our environment. You're the ones that make sure that we have clean water to drink, clean air to breathe. You're the ones that make sure that our food is safe to eat, and on and on and on. You are the social safety net. 46 million Americans, 46 million Americans, one out of six are poor. That's more than the populations of this state, New York, and Florida combined. The poverty rate is the highest it's been in almost 20 years. And the typical family got poor in the last decade. Now get this, yet the average paycheck for CEOs at big companies was $11 million last year. $11 million, 23% higher than 2009. This inequality has a huge impact on our on our quality of life. Not only does it affect working families today, if it continues, it will limit the opportunities our children will have for tomorrow. The issues we take on are not determined by political ideology, but by our mission. And our mission remains standing up for our members in every state, in every city, in every county where our rights are at risk and public services are being dismantled. You know, we've built strong coalitions wherever we're under attack. We've developed that Main Street movement consisting of students and retirees and civil rights organizations and the, the faith-based community. And all over this country, we are saying enough is enough. We see the greatest inequity in income, wages and wealth in the industrial world, and is designed to get higher and larger. We see 1% of the rich and wealthy owns 30% of the wealth of this nation. There's just something wrong with that. 1% breaks in 20% of the income in a 12-month period. Now, there's nothing wrong with being rich. I suspect every one of us would want to be rich. But why then, if you've got access to all that you can possibly use, you want to punish those who are struggling to survive? Those are the two philosophies that are at war right now. The top 10% of our folks are better off than the bottom 50%. That's something, when I say this, people say, well, you, you just want to start class warfare. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We have to talk about these kinds of disparities and differences. We, we're all familiar with the process by which you divide people into neat little packages and boxes and squares. Uh, you, you draw on those things that they fear the most. Uh, you use the divisive tactics that set one group on this, against another so they never come together uh, and think about their own interests. To keep us confused, uh, they said region against region, black against white, brown against this. Uh, and we spend our time worrying about the petty peaks we may have with each other as opposed to who's driving to the bank with all of the wealth that we need to have a decent country. So brothers and sisters, we are AFSME. We are the biggest and we are the best public sector union in America. The 
State Senator from Wisconsin, one of the famous 14, recently spoke in our state and says, our current political climate is a direct attack on women. So I've been privileged. I'm a lawyer, I'm a legislator, I'm a senator, and I'm a Wisconsin 14. I am living the American dream. <laughs> And it's all because of the foundation upon which I stand. The one that's in those posters, but the one that was right in my house, my parents. They paved the way for me with those union jobs that they had. See, I'm the seed of a steel worker, and I'm proud to say that I am. See, as a woman and as an African American, I stand on the shoulders of so many that fought that died, that suffered, so that I could have the rights that I enjoy today. When the Constitution was written and the Bill of Rights, I wasn't part of we the people. Women, we weren't part of we the people. I enjoy the dream. Washington, you enjoy the dream too, women. As women, it still sometimes seems that we haven't quite arrived where we need to since we can't even get a Congress that believes in equal pay. But my point is we do enjoy the dream. And we are now a part of we the people. In Wisconsin, our governor and his rubber stamp buddies, my colleagues in the Senate, and even those in the assembly, decided that things like Planned Parenthood, mammogram screens, cervical cancer exams, pap smears, that those things don't need to be funded. If they affiliate, affiliate, not if you do it, but if you affiliate with someone who does abortions, they don't need it has been the same shameful thing in, the state, in our state budget that we've seen at the federal level, frankly. And our GOP leaders have just attacked women. Shameful it is to watch the GOP congressman from Florida honestly ask the chair of the DNC, Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz, to act like a lady. Now, of course, what he wanted was for her to be quiet and sit down <laughs> and just respect his wisdom. <laughs> well, that's shameful that he thought it. But I wish I could have told him. <laughs> Sir, well-behaved women seldom make history. State employees are saving tax dollars and leaving a smaller footprint on the planet by composting tons of the daily waste from the state capitol. People bring in items, food items, or things that could be composted from home for food or whatever reason, and, and when they're done with their meal or, or whatever, they take it into a central area where we have compost bins that are clearly marked for compost with organic liners in them. And then each evening the custodian comes and uh, they pull that bag out and they take it out to the dumpster out the back of the building um, where it's collected by another company where they take it to the re composting center. Not only is, is it good for the environment, um, it's also good for the taxpayers. We're able to save time and labor. Um, it's good for the environment. We're not sending all that uh, biological material into the landfills so it, it doesn't compost there, but it's actually managed appropriately so that it doesn't put a lot of extra methane into the atmosphere. It reduces carbon. Uh. We can infer based on uh, 2008 numbers versus 2010 numbers that we've reduced about 270 tons of material going to the landfill every year. Right now in Thurston County, it's $110 a ton to send material to the landfill. Overall, we recycle everything we can. We recycle paper, cardboard, aluminum cans, glass, plastic bottles. And what this does is it rounds it out, the program, so that with the organics, we're now able to recycle nearly everything that comes onto the Capitol campus. 
it isn't just the custodians, but it's everybody on the Capitol campus participating in that program. Without the support of, of every employee and visitors to the campus, we wouldn't be able to make that program work. Ross Reeder remembers an important person in the Federation's history. Norm Scott died in Hoquiam, Washington, close to his home in Ocean Shores on March 21, 2011. He was 89. Norm Scott was the Federation of State Employees' first executive director from 1952 to 1974. During that time, he established the Federation as the State Employees' Union, instituted a civil rights committee in the early 1960s, and instituted the drive that brought comparable worth and pay equity to existence. Norm founded the Retirees' Chapter, went on to work with AFSCME as its regional director, and in retirement, headed the senior citizen lobby. Before coming to the Federation, Norm stuck up for Japanese Americans interned during World War II. As a union organizer, he visited union members in early 1942 at the Puyallup Fairgrounds, where they were awaiting transfer to internment centers, actually concentration camps in California and elsewhere. Under Scott, state employees won a 40-hour work week in institutions, social security coverage, health insurance, the first collective bargaining law over non-economic issues, and in 1960, the voter-approved civil service initiative filed by the Federation. Initiative 207 ended the spoil system in hiring state, for state workers. Before then, state employees were expected to stuff envelopes in elected officials' re-election campaigns, or maybe mow their lawns on the weekends. When I became an active member of the Everett Federation of Teachers, AFT 772, I met Norm Scott as secretary of the Industrial Union Section, the Washington State Labor Council, of which AFT was a part. After I became state president, Norm was a very important person in AFT Washington life because of his IUS position. We were an organizing union. In the time I was president, AFT organized over half of the community college faculties in Washington. The industrial union section had an organizing budget, and we made great use of it in funding our organizing drives. With the help of the industrial union section, and of course AFT, that money brought more economic democracy to education workers than had occurred the first 70 years of the last century. Norm said, if there's any message at all that I think everybody in the union should try to get to the new members is that it's not just what the union accomplished, all these things for you. You need to know what would happen to you if it weren't for the union. Norm Scott, not a person you want to forget. This has been Our View, brought to you by the members of the Washington Federation of State Employees we remind you, when you accept a paycheck for your hard work, you don't give up your rights. Thank you, and watch again next month. But apparently the rich has an insatiable appetite for everything. Uh, they have a need for power beyond any that they would want to exercise or use. And, and, it's, and it's funny that it's always on somebody who's on the bottom of the ladder. If the rich fought with the rich, that would be cool as far as I'm concerned. But they want to fight with folks who are struggling just to get by. Uh, every statistics you look at now points to the decline of the middle class. Uh, decline in general for the middle class and a decline in the quality of life for just everyday working people.